Good morning, church. Are we ready to worship? All right. Let me get us started with a word to our Father. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we gather here in the harbor of your safety. We thank you for fellowship and family. Jesus Christ, we ask that you would strengthen us, restore us, and inspire us with your love. Holy Spirit, would you fill us with your peace, that as, so as we journey onward, that we will pour out your love and grace to others. Heavenly Father, we ask that our souls would catch the wind of your spirit, so that we could take your promises to all the earth. We ask that you will make us bold for Jesus Christ and to tell others to always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us. We thank you, God, for our many blessings. Jesus, your grace is our salvation. Now as we continue in worship, open our hearts and our minds to your word. And all God's people said, Amen. Good morning. Will you stand as we sing our opening hymn this morning at 640? If you're following in the hymnal, let all things now living. I'm Marilyn Long, and it's so good to be here with you at Memorial Baptist Church. Welcome those of you who are visiting with us and those that are visiting online. Welcome cards and offering envelopes are available on the back of the pews and out front. You're encouraged to join us on Wednesday nights where we are in full programming for all ages and to adult classes. Deacon ballots are available in the gathering area and in front of the sanctuary. Every year we have a Thanksgiving offering. This year our Thanksgiving offering will be given to SACRA. It is a local Christian organization founded by our pastor emeritus, Temple Myers, that adds to the needy, aids to the needy in Stanton and Augusta County. Tonight we have the youth meeting from five to seven and the deacons will be meeting at seven o'clock. The finance committee will meet tomorrow night at 6.30. And there is one other announcement I'd like to make. The WMU will also be meeting on Tuesday at 6.30. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Oh. Good morning, everyone. 
I am Roland Carlton. I will be reading the word of our Lord out of the New International Standard Version. Please join me, 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. The background is this is the Lord speaking to Solomon after the temple has been completed. And the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Thank you, Roland. And I know you just got comfy, but now I'm going to ask you to stand up again. We're going to do some singing. Uh, it looks like we're going to sing a whole bunch of songs, but they go very quickly, sort of in a little medley of thanksgiving and praise. Go ahead and stand up, everybody. Uh, if you're following in the hymnal, our first one starts off with 579, I will enter his gates. And this is a, these are some good clapping songs. If you're not holding the hymnal and you want to clap along, you can do it.
singing, you may be seated. Can I be like Kathy now? Yeah. <laughs> See if I can get down here. Morning. <laughs> Morning, everybody. by now. You should. Hello. How are you? Uh, okay. Well, then let's just get to it. Anybody know what this is? All right. Some of you. It's a box. Yes. It's a shoe box. What kind of shoe box? A Christmas shoe box. What goes in the Christmas shoe box? Stuff. Stuff goes in the Christmas shoe box. That's good. Amen. You had your hand up. What do you think goes in the shoe box? Shoes. That's true. Toys. Toys go in the Christmas shoe box. What else goes in the Christmas shoe box? Toys. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, you're peeking. You're looking at what's in there, aren't you? Well, let's open it up and see what's in here. Okay. Huh? Well, there's, there's a little bouncy ball, right? Okay. Let's see what else is in here. What's that? Seriously, socks? Why would you put socks in a Christmas shoe box? They go with shoes. That's a good answer. Socks and shoes go together. Out of the mouth of babes. It's perfect. What else is in here? Let's see. There is There's a water bottle. Yeah, it's got frozen on it. Anna and Elsa. You have a frozen water bottle too? What else is in here? Washcloths? How would you put washcloths in there? Oh, shower stuff? What is this? Rubber bands? Why are there rubber bands in there? For slingshots so you can shoot them at your brother and sister. They are for fun. You can do lots of things with rubber bands. Let's see what else is in here. We've got toothbrushes? to brush your teeth with, and let's see, a little notebook, and pencils, and a matchbox card. Oops. Do you got a notebook at home? Do you write in it? Do you take notes? Do you draw? See, there's all kinds of good stuff that goes in these shoe boxes, right? Do we know where these go to? You don't know where they go to? Different worlds. Different, different countries around the world, okay. Uh, so they go to different countries and little boys and girls in these countries. Exactly, there's some people all over the world that don't have things like we have. Some of them don't have socks or bouncy balls or rubber bands or toothbrushes, exactly. And so, and even washcloths. So, the Christmas shoe boxes that we are gonna put together this Wednesday, by the way, we're gonna work on shoe boxes as a children and youth ministry this Wednesday. And so, hint, hint, there's still time for you to bring things and drop it off at church if you'd like to participate in the Christmas shoe boxes. Shameless plug. Um, so this Wednesday, we're gonna put these together and these are going to get sent out all over the world. 
for other boys and girls your age to be able to get some gifts and some presents because Jesus said it's better for us to give than it is to receive. And so this Wednesday, we're going to work on giving just a little bit, okay? Let me pray with you guys and go sit back down. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you just for a heart of gratitude. Thank you for allowing us to, to show that gratitude to other people when we give out of the kindness, out of the love, out of the grace and mercy that you have first shown us. Lord, we thank you again for being able to be here in your house to worship together as a family. God, I pray that we honor you in everything that we do. It's in your name that we all ask. Amen. Well, that was a great crowd. Thank you so much, and good to be with you here this morning. And um, let me say that, uh, <coughs> sorry, if I do this a lot during my, my speaking time, it is because I'm still having problems with my voice and it causes me, my voice to be a little weak and sometimes even slur a little bit. But uh, also another thing to let you know, where is Robert Knotts? Oh, there he is. Coming up here with, Robert, with me, Robert. Robert is one of our deacon candidates, and you're, you may be wondering, why are there so many people having so many different parts in the worship service? And it's because um, I had a little idea earlier this week. We, it's often people complain that they don't know who our deacon candidates are, and so we were able to work eight out of nine of them into the service one um, Ralph Kirtland is not able to be here this weekend but we'll have him in part of the worship service next week as well so the the readers the prayers the announcement giver they are all candidates uh, for your consideration for deacons and the the ballots are out in the uh, gathering area of the church uh, a few announcements to pray for first of all Welcome to the world, Leilani Martin, daughter of Alexis Martin, Don, Dan and Tricia Martin, grandparents. She was born 11.20 a.m. on this past Friday. Also, Christian sympathy to Eric Karimsky in the loss of his grandfather this past Tuesday. Continue to pray for those people in our church dealing with cancer and his treatments, Jason Jones, Sue Wisman, Donnie Meeks, Jim Harner, Tommy Crawford, John Clatterball. Also, uh, we want to also continue to remember Matt Barraclough's uh, sister, Amy, Raylan Chittam, Paige Heiser, Andrea Barkley. Andrea is um, one of the adults that is in our, um, our Promise Sunday School class. She had a motorcycle accident this past uh, Wednesday. A uh, little, little bit binged up, uh, some broken ribs, a broken arm, um, some, well, anyway, uh, some bruising of the face. She is at home, and uh, I'm sure she is watching us right now. Uh, Mike Seller is somebody we've been praying for, a severe case of COVID. He was able to come home. However, there will be breathing difficulties for some time. Continue to pray for him. Kevin Lacey has heart issues as well. And continue to remember special circumstances at Middle River Jail, James Burns and Meshach Suckridge. Then also God gives us opportunities as he gives us the vision to reach our area for Jesus Christ as we continue to regather from COVID. Uh, we have the, a lot of opportunities, but the culture has shifted on us considerably that God gives understanding and vision before us as well. And now, um, Robert Knotts will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you once again to be in your house today. We thank you to be able to offer the opportunity to witness that, uh, to uh, a world that is lost. And Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to uh, worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, you've heard the names mentioned here. Nothing catches you by surprise. Lord, we can't begin to imagine 
all the heartache and turmoil that's going on. Lord, just thank you for these uh, folks that have been mentioned here that's uh, continued recovery. Lord, I ask that you be with those ones that have uh, hospitals, Lord, the ones that have lost loved ones. Lord, that you strengthen and encourage them. Father, we thank you for this house that we come to this morning, each family that's represented here. Father, we ask that you lead God and direct us each and every day. Father, we bring, ask that you bring with Mark as he brings a message later on here, that you will speak to our hearts, open our minds, give us peace, guidance, and comfort. Go with us through this day, and what we say, what we do, will bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. While the bell ringers are getting in place, I'll just tell you a little bit about this piece that we're going to ring for you today. It's called Offerings of Praise. And if you listen carefully, it is going to incorporate and weave together three different songs of praise, starting with the doxology, which is, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Um, and the second song is a children's song I remember singing as a child. Um, everything was made by God, everything you see. Anybody remember that one? Yes? And then the last one is um, praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning. And actually, our little we worshipers are going to sing that for you next Sunday. For the first time since um, Christmas of 2019, our children are going to be here singing next week and so um, that is very very exciting um, but I hope you will listen I get super excited about stuff like this you know all these different melodies but you'll hear them individually and then if you listen real carefully you'll hear them woven together and they're all great songs of praise
Good morning. I'm Danny Flavin, and I'll be reading 2 Chronicles 12, verses 1 through 6. After Rehoboam's position as king was established, and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord. Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, with 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of Libyans, Sukites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shehemiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for the fear of Shehak, and he said to them, This is what the Lord says, You have abandoned me, Therefore, I now abandon you, Shehak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. I'm reading chapter, verse 7 through 12. When the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, the Lord's message came to Shemach, They have humbled themselves. I will not destroy them, but will grant them a little deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishkah. However, they will become his servant. So they, they recognize the difference between serving me and serving the kingdom of their land. So King Hishkah of Egypt went to, the, went to the war against Jerusalem. He seized the treasures of the Lord temple and the treasuries of the royal palace. He took everything he took the world the gold shield that Solomon had made King Wilbom made bronze shields in their place and committed them into the care of the captain of the royal escorts to guard the entrance of the king palace whenever the king entered the Lord temple the world escort will carry the shield and take them back to the world escort armory armory when Wilbom humbled himself the Lord anger turned away from him. He did not destroy them completely. Beside that, conditionally, were good in Judah. Good morning, church family. I'm Susie Anthony. I wanted to read Chronicles, Chronicles um, 12, 13 through 16. King Roabama was to establish his himself in Belitta established himself firmly in Jerusalem and continued as king. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of the, all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name, Nahama, was an Ammonite. He did evil because he did not set his heart on seeking the Lord. As for the events of Rehoboam's reign from beginning to end are not written are not written in the records of Shehanam, the prophet, and Iddo, the seer of the deal of genealogies. There was continual warfare from Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam rested with his ancestors and buried in the city of David, and Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. <laughs> and Danny and Milton and Susie, as somebody that has studied six hours of graduate Hebrew and have a, has a Masters of Divinity and has been preaching the word for 36 years, I want you to know that you pronounced every name correctly. <laughs> and if you did, they don't know the difference. <laughs> well, we, for a reason, we uh, read the entire 12th chapter of Second Chronicles, but I, I uh, encourage you to keep that open because we're going to paint a br broad brush as we look over that and, and also go into some detail. And as you're doing that, of course, I've got a short story to tell you. A guy is driving down the road in his brand new Ferrari. And it, as he's doing this, as he's parked when, uh, at the light, uh, a little old man pulls up beside him in his moped. And he said, my goodness, son, that is a fast-looking car. And the man looked at him and said, well, it is. 
And he leaned inside the car and looked around and said, my goodness, that is a good looking car inside. And the, and the light changed and the man said, I don't have time to talk to you. And he took off and depressed the old man. He went 110 miles per hour just like that. But as he was driving in the road, all kinds of, he just proud of, of how fast his car was, he looked in the rearview mirror, and there was that old man in his moped catching up with him and passed him. Zoom! And then he looks up ahead, and he sees a spot coming fat toward him very fast. And it's coming so fast he can barely see it, and then boom! Well, I think that was the old man in the moped. And then he looks at his rearview mirror, and he sees the old man coming up on him again, and coming up on him so fast that the guy stops his Ferrari and hits the back of his, of his Ferrari and just lays the old man out. The guy comes out of his car. He said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that that happened. Obviously, we've, we've ruined your moped. I'm, I've already called the ambulance. Is, is there something I can do for you right now? And the old man looks at him and whispers, yes, would you unhook my suspenders from your side view mirror? <laughs> well, I didn't blow the punchline. Well, that's a quick change that no one expected. Historians will tell you that because of communication and, and media, history changes quicker these days than it ever has in the past. It's because of, of and for those of you that are, are, are 35 years and younger, there was a day when we did not have the internet or internet accessible to everybody, but because of the internet, because of cable news, and because we're all expected to have it, we have media marketing algorithms and, and influencers that we all keep up with, or some of us keep up with, and it changes things so quickly that literally no one can keep up with all the changes that are happening in our culture. Sounds kind of desperate, does it? But listen, we as Christians are a people of hope. And our hope is in our God who does not change. He's the true north to which we can always return to. And he calls us back to it constantly because we are prone to drift. Now, during the last two weeks, I... We looked at David's dedication to giving the, to the temple in First Chronicles. And, uh, and it was passing on the mantle of the kingship from David to Solomon. Now, now, David, of course, as we talked about, wanted desperately to build that temple. But because he was a man that shed blood, uh, God said, no, this will be passed on to your son Solomon. So David did what he could. He and other leaders set aside the materials to build the temple. And it was 20 years of building that Solomon led his people to do. And as he was getting prepared, and let me tell you something, this was at the peak, the peak of influence of the nation of Israel. The people of Israel, or the Hebrew people, have been with us for 4,000 years. They've been with us without a country for half that. And still, through God's providence and his covenants, he has kept them together as a people. Man, I, there is nobody in history that God has done that with. And, but during that time, for one generation, just one generation, they were... The, the leading world power at that time. And as they were, as God was speaking to Solomon and, and Solomon shared with his people, and you've heard this, uh, this verse read so many times, and we, we said it here at the church, but you'll hear it out in the culture. And in fact, I was thinking as I, as I was making it out to my truck to come to church, 
I think I've seen 2 Chronicles 7, 14 in the past 10 years quoted more than I have John 3, 16. But here's what it is once again. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn away from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And as I read that, I, I looked at that, and I, I assumed that just offhandedly knowing the, the history of the people of, of Judah and Israel, that that would be a prophecy for future generations. But as I was doing my my daily Bible readings and, and reading forward from this passage, I realized that it would be less than one generation, one generation when this Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 714 would be put to the challenge of the people. One generation away. We know if if you study Solomon much, we know that he was very faithful to God when he started out. But as he looked around and as he married, my goodness, think about this, guys. 700 wives with 300 concubines. I mean, how did he keep up with their names? But anyway, that, that's a different thing. But, but, but he was told, he was told not to marry outside of his faith. And most of these 700 wives and, and 300 concubines were outside of the people of Israel. And one of the sons of one of the wives was Rehoboam. So Rehoboam, who is, who is the king that we're about to speak to, Rehoboam was raised from a pagan mother uh, and his father, who set the example for his life, became more and more like a pagan as he progressed further in life. So they were already drifting away from the covenants of God. Now, as we go further, we read a story about how Rehoboam and his foolishness lost 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then later, as we have read we have the invasion of the king of Shishak. In the fifth verse we read in the 12th and um, 14th chapter of Second Chronicles. He says, you have abandoned me, therefore I have abandoned you into the hand of Shishak. Second Chronicles does not tell us exactly what was going on. And so for insight, we have First Kings 12, 22 through 24, and I don't know if you know this, but First and Second Chronicles are, are, is the history of the people of Israel and Judah written from one perspective, and then First and Second Samuels and First and Second Kings are written from a different perspective, even though the truths are the same. Still, you find a lot of details in First and Second Kings that you don't find in the Chronicles. And so here's what we read in Kings about Rehoboam. Judah, Judah did what was evil in the Lord's eyes. They provoked him to jealous anger more than all that their ancestors had done with the sins they had committed. They also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and Asherah poles on every hill and under every green tree. There were even male pro cult prostitutes in the land. They imitated all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. Now, there's insight that you need to understand about how far the people of Israel broke covenant with God. You need to understand high places, sacred pillars, and astral poles. These were places where the people initially set up worship away from the temple. And we'll explain why that was a problem. Their, their motivations were good at first. The high places. The high places were places where they tried to worship God. They didn't want to go to the temple. And, and obviously, you couldn't get in your car or a train and, and ride over to, to the temple in Jerusalem. But the temple of Jerusalem taught the truth. 
the high places because the people did not have access to scripture as we do today. And because there, there was an ignorance of the word of God, they, they, they did have the law of Moses, but much, much of it was handed down verbally. And so they didn't understand the purity of the covenants of God. They did not have priests to lead them in that. And so they kind of weaned it. They kind of weaned it, and it did not take long to, to move over to the, the sacred pillars and Asherah poles. The sacred pillars were the pillars of Baal. We know about the Baal worship. We know that was the pagan worship, standard pagan worship of the nations around Israel. And Asherah, Asherah was a fertility goddess and of, of, the, of the Baals. And so what they figured out, they, they looked at God and they said, well, we believe in God and we refer to him in masculine pronouns, obviously, because all the other pagan gods need a wife, a goddess. Therefore, we will provide a bride for God. And her name is Asherah. And so it did not take them long for them to go into pagan practices. And it did not take long for the worship of God to look more like the pagans than it did for correct worship of God. And so the people drifted, and it did not take long, even without the internet and the cable TV, it did not take the people long to drift away to, to be more like the pagan nations than the called apart people that God had called them to be. Let me ask you something. Could something like that ever happen to the people that are called by God's name today? Well, folks, it has happened. It has happened throughout history. Our history in Christianity or of the church is a constant drifting away, and these three sins, I'll go into that, a constant drifting away from what God's standards are. And then God, if, if the people will listen to him, God draws them back. We call that drawing, drawing back to God as a renewal. But I also got some good news, that even in the down times, there are always a remnant always a remnant of people that are faithful to God, that have not broken covenant with God, that have not broken away from God's teaching. Now, I believe that, that these things come in three to four generation cycles, and we are in the third to fourth generation cycle of drift away from God. I can talk all day about that. But folks, these are... These are cycles that we have dealed with. As, as God says, because you have abandoned me, I have abandoned you. He said this 2,900 years ago. What God tends to do, instead of, and we often think of this, God bringing down the hammer on us, and sometimes he does that. But more often, God just takes his hand away. And let the Shishaks of the world come in and devour us. Well, let me share with you three things that I believe that we have struggled with. Now, I mentioned to you, uh, or we struggled with today, I mentioned to you that the people of Israel had a tendency to want to marry God, marry God to paganism. Mary God to Asherah, the pagan goddess of fertility. But we have married God to different pagan beliefs. Let me share with you, first of all. We have married God to politics. Now, back in, in the days of Israel, God never wanted a king for Israel. But the people insisted, they insisted, that they be like the other pagan nations. And so after a while, God removed his hand of protection and let them have that situation. 
He knew that they would drift under a king because a, a king is tempted by power and influence. And just as, uh, just as we've seen throughout history, kings, presidents, dictators, if there was a religion in the land, they try to co-op, very often, not always, they try to co-op that religion because they see power in the religion. And they see that as an opportunity to leverage power over the people. We saw that in Israel, and we also see that today. Probably the most shameful thing in Christian history is right around the 4th century A.D., when Christianity became so strong in the Roman Empire that the Roman Empire conveniently made Christianity the official religion. And that is when, when we started joining church and state together, that is when the, the powers that be, the political powers, co-opted our religion. Now, not that, our, not that our faith has not remained strong and independent of these people. Not that for the past 1,600 years we haven't had faithful people. But people, that are, the average person, has a tendency to drift and let other people influence their direction. Has that ever happened in our country? Folks, it's happening right now. I remember... I was thinking about this as my notes, but I remember the generation before me, the pastors that, the first three pastors that I served under, that they came from, uh, they came of age in the 60s and early 70s, and to them, they couldn't see how you could be a good Christian without being a Democrat. They, 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 they were interested in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. They were, they were interested in, in uh, being against the Vietnam War. They were interested in poverty issues. And so they believed that the Democratic Party was part of their way that they could influence Christianity on the culture. Didn't take but a generation for that to move the other way, as we were concerned about other issues such as, as abortion and sexuality and other things. And so a lot of people today feel like, how can you be a Christian without being a Republican? Folks, they are political institutions. And, and let me say this, I've said this many times, your faith should drive your political choices. But your political choices should not own your faith. And we have seen through recent history, and fr fr frankly, folks, we have seen through the entirety of our history that there is a, a selling out or people compromising their faith and Christian, Christianizing things that have no business being called Christian through the political process. Folks, keep in mind, your Lord is Jesus Christ. He sets the standards of what you believe. And the foundations of what we believe is right and wrong. Do not, do not sell that out to a political party or a political figure. And I'm not speaking against Republicans. I'm not speaking out against Democrats or independents or communists or socialists or, or anybody else, folks. You are a Christian first. The kingdom of God is your first citizenship. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you will be you will be a better Democrat, or you will be a better Republican. But don't let the culture, the political culture, don't let it be married to your Christianity. I've got a lot of things to say. 
but I'm about to run into the Sunday school, the 11 o'clock Sunday school class, which is excellent, and I encourage you to be a part of that. Next week, we're going to look at two other very difficult things that we have married God to. You are a people set apart. We talked about that in our Sunday school lesson at 9 o'clock, or you're going to talk about it in your Sunday school lesson at 11 o'clock. We are a people of the covenant. In Sunday school, you, you, you talked about compromising, understanding God's plan, but compromising and creating chaos that exists generationally to this day. Do not compromise. Do not marry your Christian faith to paganism, to an outside culture. Know the difference. How do you know the difference? You spend time in the Word of God. How do you know the difference? You spend time in prayer. How do you know the difference? You, you spend time together with other brothers and sisters in Christ, and you encourage each other. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why, and I'm so glad that we're able to offer these services online. But, folks, as, as I was having a conversation with, with somebody before worship, there's nothing like being here together in person. That's why God created the church, because he knew that we needed each other. He knows that, that without each other, we tend to drift. Without a focus on God, we tend to drift. And like the ancient Israelites, it doesn't take long for you to drift and drift and drift, and all of a sudden, there's no difference between you and an ungodly world. You have been married to it. But perhaps you've not taken that first step of knowing who Jesus Christ is. This is what we believe. We believe that God created us for love, a love relationship with him could not be more intimate, both in this life and throughout eternity. We are sinners. I think we all realize that. Sin separates us from God. Jesus Christ came and paid the price on the cross for our sins, shed his blood, sacrificed himself for our sins. And if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that sacrifice that he made on the cross, forgives us of our sins. Not that we won't struggle, but that is when grace enters into our life. The Holy Spirit comes into our life, and we have a direction, a hope. Our, our present is guaranteed, and our eternity is guaranteed. Asking Jesus Christ, into our life to be our Lord and Savior. Have, have you done that yet? Have you asked Christ into your life? Perhaps God is leading you to another decision. Perhaps he is calling you to be a, a member, member of this church. Or perhaps he just has laid something on your heart that you need to come to the altar. And just between you and him, bring it before him. You are invited to respond to God's invitation to you. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 639, Now Think We All Are God. Please stand.
it's comfortable coming forward during the invitation time, I will be available to you in the gathering area. And now, Jerry Burns, would you close us in prayer? Good morning. May we bow in prayer. We are here to pray to you, Father, and uh, thank you for this day, and thank you for this building that we can all get together here as brothers and sisters and lift you up in prayer and songs, Lord. And Father, we always love you, and uh, you give us everything. Your hand guides and protects us. Father, we always look up to you. And Father, we love you so much that we love you with all our heart, mind, and soul. And we pray in our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.